Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. Again, welcome to our new normal. Welcome to our house. And um, again, with this pandemic, I think we're looking at everything a little bit different and maybe re-looking everything. So this week's lecture will deal with, uh, in fact, it'll be a double lecture this week and next, uh, dealing with clothing. There's a saying that clothing makes the man or woman. The clothes we wear, the styles that we choose, make a strong statement. They tell people who we are or who we want to be, even before we have spoken a word. Clothing can be divided into different categories. We dress to impress. We do it for work, for pleasure, for sports, for gender, for age, for comfort, for the weather, for protection, and also as an expression of our religious choices. Clothes, clothes not only cover and protect our bodies, the clothes that you wear will many times have a great influence on how people will relate to you. Many religious sects dress in different and unusual ways, such as those that follow the Eastern religions. Muslims have their dress code, as do Orthodox Jews. In fact, there's a story told of Rabbi uh, Dr. Avram Tursky. Uh, he was on a flight, and he was dressed in his normal Hasidic garb. He had a long black coat, a white shirt, and a black hat. There was a woman who was sitting next to him on the plane, and she began to talk to him in Yiddish. She said that she didn't understand why he had to dress in a manner that he did. He, she said it was an embarrassment to all normal Jews. He turned to her and said, excuse me, madam, but what language are you speaking? I, I, I don't understand what you're saying. She repeated her statement in English and he replied, I really don't know why you're talking, what you're talking about. You see, I'm a follower of the Amish religion. Oh, wow. She quickly apologized for her mistake and began to compliment him in his connection to his faith. He then began to speak to her in a perfect Yiddish. He said to her, let me see if I understand you correctly. If I'm Amish, then you like me and you respect me. And if I'm Jewish and you see me as antiquated and out of touch, and I'm an embarrassment to you. Imagine if you went to a masquerade party and you dressed up like a policeman. You might actually feel like you are an officer of the law. If a woman would dress up like a nun, she may feel and act in a manner, that manner, as a religious individual. If she dressed up as a woman of the night, she might well act in a totally different manner. Not only her attitude, but how others relate to her may be completely different. You know, when I served in the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War, I found that people related to my uniform and not to me. I was a soldier, not Marty Goodman. So religiously, how do we look at clothing? Man, at the beginning of creation, did not wear any clothing. He was naked. There was no differentiation between any part or limb of his body. Shame did not exist. There was nothing to hide or cover up. The Malbum states that the body was that which was made to cover up the soul. However, we have turned the body into an entity of its own. This brought about a blurring between content and clothing and a separation between body and soul. Now, man was naked before the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge, E.H. Adas. His whole body was covered with a nail-like substance that was removed after he ate from the tree of knowledge. When we look at our fingertips, we have a reminder of what man's original body covering looked like. This is one of the reasons that we look at our fingernails when we perform the ritual of what we call Havdalah on Saturday night when Shabbos leaves. We do so when we make the blessing over the burning candle. In fact, the word Havdalah, which means to separate, is the prayer that we recite whenever we transit from the Sabbath or the holidays to the secular and mundane part of the week. It was only after Adam and Chava, first man and woman, had eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they realized that they were naked. All of a sudden, they realized they needed something to cover their genitalia. Their childlike innocence was gone forever. The Torah tells us that initially they covered themselves with fig leaves. 
But somehow they realized that covering their private parts was not enough of a covering to stand before God Almighty. And so they hid in the garden when God called out to them. It was God who fashioned the first clothing that Adam and Chava wore, a kindness that we try to emulate. The Torah uses the word kosnos to describe the garments that God made from them. We find the same term used for Yosef, where his father gives him a very special garment called the kosonus pasen, a coat of many colors. We find the same term used to describe the knitted tunic, the kosonus tashbates, one of the four special garments that the high priest wore. Now, all of these garments were connected with spirituality and beauty, as God told Moshe that, what, that when he would make the clothing for the high priest, they should be the kavod or the tiferet, for honor and for beauty. As they say, clothes make the man. And so we see a connection between Adam, his katonis, the first man, and Aaron, the first high priest, with the word kasonis. The verse in the portion of Bereshit 321 that tells us that God made garments for him. And this verse has eight words, which is an allusion to the eight articles of clothing that the high priest wore. So in what merit did Adam deserve these garments? After all, he had just sinned. Since he had shown humility before God, realizing that he was naked, both physically and spiritually, then he merited that God should make for him these special garments, the power of tshuva, of repentance. We read in the beginning of the book of Bereshit that the two sons of Adam took on professions. Cain, Cain, became a farmer and planted flax. Hevel, his younger brother, became a shepherd and raised sheep. Now, why did they specifically choose these two professions? Nothing is an accident. They had everything that they needed, but the one thing that they did need was clothing to wear. So, Cain, Cain grew flax so that he could make linen garments, and Hevel she raised sheep so that he could make woolen garments. We have a commandment not to wear shotness, and shotness which is a combination of wool and linen together. This is a commandment without any reason. It's called a chok, a statute. However, it may connect to the first murder that was perpetrated in history, where Cain, Cain killed his brother, Hevel. We see that both Cain and Hevel brought a sacrifice to God. Why did Cain bring his offering from produce, flax, and Hevel an animal sacrifice, a sheep? It wasn't until Noah left the ark that man was permitted to have benefit from killing an animal. So Cain equated himself with God. So just like man was not permitted to receive any benefit from killing an animal, so too God could not benefit in any way from killing an animal. Hevel understood that man and God were on two completely different levels. So that which was forbidden for man's benefit could easily be permitted for the benefit of God. And this is why the verse which speaks of God accepting Hevel's offering adds the words, Gam hu also he, to teach us that God not only accepted Hevel's offering, but also his logic. Whereas with Cain, God rejected not only his offering, again, but also Cain and his logic, which put man on the same level as God. Somehow God did not want their opposing viewpoints represented even in the clothing that a Jew wears. For one to equate man with God is blasphemy. The next mention of clothes in the Torah is in the portion of Noah, 9.21. We read there that Noah plants a vineyard, he drinks of wine, he gets drunk, and he gets naked in his tent. There were so many questions. Why would the first thing that he planted after the flood, why would it be a vineyard? Also, how could it grow so quickly? It would seem that God had blessed it. And why would he be naked in his tent? I believe that all these questions are related. The Shalom HaKadosh writes, when Noah planted his vineyard, which was the tree of knowledge, the great, he intended to repair the damage done by Adam, first man. But he sinned. He drank too much wine. And even with the best of intentions, one must not overestimate 
his spiritual capacity, nor should he underestimate it. Be honest with yourself. The greatest lie you can tell is to yourself. The Hassam Sofer states this may also be why he was naked in his tent. He was attempting to reach the pristine state of Adam before he ate from the tree of knowledge, a time of purity where clothes were not necessary. When Noach saw, pardon me, what Noach saw as a blessing from God was in reality an action of the side of evil. There's a Medrash Tanchuma that states when Noach was planting his vineyard that Satan came and asked what he was doing. Satan then asked Noach if he could water the garden, the vineyard, and Noach agreed. So Satan brought a lamb, a lion, a monkey, and a pig, and he watered the vineyard with their blood. And that's the story of drinking. Before man drinks, he's innocent as a lamb. Then when he begins to st drinking, he becomes strong like a lion. Then he drinks some more and he becomes silly like a monkey. And then finally, he wallows in his own vomit like a pig. We learn a great lesson from Noah's actions before and after the flood. Though Noah warned and rebuked his generation, somehow, somehow it wasn't personal. God had already assured him that he and his family would be safe and that That knowledge of the fact that he would be saved gave Noah great comfort. He followed God's command to the letter, but did he truly believe? Rashi states in 7 7 in the portion of Noah that even Noah was of those who had little faith. He believed and he did not believe that the flood would come. However, after the flood, when he stepped out of the ark and realized that he was now the father and the grandfather of all mankind, he now took on a totally different approach. Life became very personal. Now, he was not only concerned about the present and the future, he also felt compelled to correct even the past so as to care for his descendants. Therefore, he planted a vineyard and got naked in his tent to correct the sin of Adam. But he drank min hayayin, from the wine. What does that mean, high eye and the wine? What's that mean? Our sages tell us that one reason why mankind was given permission to eat meat after the flood was that man's physiological makeup diminished and he now had a need for more protein in his diet. Similarly, it may well have been that the high eye, the same amount of wine that Noah would have drunk before the year in the, in the, of the, in the flood, in the ark, that would not have affected him much now due to his weakened physical state, got him drunk and he passed out in the tent. So we see that even though Noah failed in his effort to correct the new world, still he tried. Why? Because <laughs> he saw it as personal. And that's how we need to see the troubles of those around us as personal, especially now with this pandemic. We need to laugh with people. We need to cry with them. We need to listen to their worries and concerns. We need to connect with them. And that is what Noah wouldn't do before the flood. And this is what Noah couldn't do after the flood. Look around you. We still have time. You read in the book, in the Torah, in the book of Bereshit, in the portion of Toldos, 2715. It tells us that Yitzchak, our father, wanted to bless his eldest son, Esau. He wanted to bless him with a material blessing before he would die. Rivka, his wife, felt that the blessing should go to their younger son, Yaakov, instead. And so she took Esau's clothing and put him on her younger son, Yaakov. She thought that since Yitzchak was blind, he would unknowingly give the blessing to Yaakov instead of Esau. Now, there are different reasons given for her giving Esau, Yaakov Esau's clothing for him to wear. We know that when people are blind, many times their other senses are enhanced. And so she was afraid that Yitzhak might smell Yaakov's scent. And so she clothed him in Esau's clothing. And as I mentioned before, clothes make the man. Rivka understood that Yaakov, dressed as a Yaakov, could not stealthily take the blessings from Esau. 
But if he were to dress in his brother's clothing, he would then take on some of his brother's negative traits and then would be able to deviously take the blessings. And so Yaakov took Esau's material blessing by wearing his clothing. And we see in the world today that the wealth of the Jewish world is in the hands of irreligious Jews. This is because a Jew can only connect to this material blessing when he is dressed up like an Esau, not like a Yaakov. So we see the long hand of history of what things have done in the past and how they affect us in the present. I think next week we'll continue again showing how clothing in the Torah tells us and makes a difference. Again, this concept of what we call sneas, of modesty, and how important it is in our lives. And with that, and hopefully us following what God has commanded us to do against the idea of modesty, we will herald it in the coming of Mashiach Zikainu quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. God bless, be well, be safe, be happy, have a great Shabbat.